our most recent uh, Card uh, we're actually having a cardiovascular grand round in the middle of uh, an internal medicine grand round and trying to find my way to do the speaker and the, uh, the camera at the same time. It is really my pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker. Um, we, as many of you know, who have been here at University of Louisville for a while, uh, that we have an annual Gross Family Lectureship Fund. That was actually donated by Dr. Saul Gross in honor uh, of his family. Uh, he has donated this to the University of Louisville in recognition of the clinical areas represented by members of the Gross family. In memory of the brothers, uh, in recognition of their contributions and dedication to the practice of medicine. Uh, the first one was actually Dr. Jerome Gross, who uh, graduated from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in 1929. Uh, that was, he was quickly followed by Dr. Joseph Groth, who was at UofL School of Medicine, and he was in the class of 1930. The next brother was Alex Groth at UofL uh, School of Medicine, class of 1932. And fi finally, Dr. Benjamin Groth, UofL School of Medicine, class of 1940. This lectureship actually rotates annually among the departments of surgery, obstetrics, gynecology, medicine and family and community uh, medicine at U of L. And there's one lecture per year, as I mentioned, and uh, just fortunately uh, for us uh, today, uh, the lectureship fell to, card to um, uh, the Department of Medicine. And so in thinking of, as a new chair, of who is it that I would like to have give our one annual lecture that we're gonna have essentially annual lecture every four years, okay? Uh, who would I like to do? And there's no one I could think of uh, any more highly than Dr. Jerome Bax. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Dinesh Kalra, our chief of cardiology, to introduce uh, uh, JJ, is what we call him. But uh, I just have to say that he was a young uh, cardiologist doing nuclear, kind of like me, uh, when we met, which was really 31 years ago. Uh, at a meeting, and we were both interested in uh, myocardial metabolism and finding new and different ways or applying old ways of imaging to try to uh, make it expand. Uh, and both of our careers have taken off, and we've kept up with each other and so many times, and um, uh, that interaction, has, I think, helped us both. We end up both uh, realizing the importance of not only academia and mentorship, but also the importance of societies. Uh, and medical societies and how we could actually, with guidelines, we could actually change the field uh, of cardiology. Um, it's um, really unusual to have uh, two people become friends and then many, many years later, both become presidents of their society. Uh, and we overlapped at, uh, as uh, presidencies between the European Society of Cardiology and American College of Cardiology. And what I've learned about JJ is that he was always honest. He was always uh, a, a leader who was had forethought and vision. And I really appreciate that. So I'm going to just publicly say that. So the, the one little snippet was, um, yes, since many of you know, if you do cardiology, the ESC, American Heart and American College used to do uh, guidelines together. And so uh, we felt like they were pulling away from us a little bit at ESC. And I, you know, I said, you know, and we were just wondering, what is it going on? Are they trying to impact, in, improve, improve their journal impact factor uh, by doing that? I never told you the story, but okay. And uh, we thought that they were just going to do their own thing. And so I talked to JJ, and you know, he said, you know, we're trying to improve our impact factor. It's absolutely honest. Uh, and, and the reason to do that is because it was going to make the field better as well. And so again, person with honesty and vision and leadership, and I appreciate that very much. And with that, all that personal stuff, uh, <laughs> Dr. Cowra will do our official gross lecture uh, uh, introduction. Thank you, Dr. Cowra. Thank you, Kim. And it's, uh, like you said, such an honor to have uh, Dr. Bax here, who's visiting us from Leiden in the Netherlands. And for uh, those of us in cardiology, uh, Dr. Bax has left and continues to leave such a lasting impression uh, with his leadership. So yesterday he gave us a lecture um, in cardiology, and it's truly amazing that he has trained over 100 postdocs. Uh, and these are people who have gone across various corners of the globe and have started their own programs. 
So one of the marks of a leader is how many people they train and leave an impression on and start their career. So Dr. Bax is truly noteworthy in that regard. He's a fantastic researcher uh, as well as an innovative scientist. So just a little brief, brief background on Dr. Bax. So he is an MD, PhD. He does his MD from the University of Leiden, his uh, PhD from the Free University of Amsterdam and then went on to do multimodality imaging. Uh, as Dr. Williams mentioned, he's done a lot of work in nucleus cardiology, but he wears many, many hats. He, he's a world-renowned re echocardiographer. He's contributed seminal work to the field of coronary CT, cardiac MRI, and he still continues to innovate and teach and do fantastic research in so many ways. Uh, I won't mention all his honors because uh, those are too numerous to enumerate, but I'll just hit on some of the highlights. He's been past president of ESC, as you know. Uh, he is uh, he has won multiple awards, including the Douglas Zipes American College of Cardiology Award in 2008, the Distinguished Scientist Award from the American College of Cardiology in 2013, the Marie Curie European Association Nuclear Medicine Award in 2013. And there's a whole page of awards that I won't go through. He is on the editorial boards of multiple journals, including the Journal of American College of Cardiology, the European Heart Journal. And he's been uh, in various societies as either leader on the board of trustees or on the advisory council of these societies. Uh, but mostly what he's proud of is his continued research and all the fellows who work with him and come up with brilliant ideas. So it's really an honor for us to have him today to talk to us about coronary disease and how our concepts in this common disease have changed over time. And he uh, just has a fantastic talk on this that will be really illuminating. Uh, and I really welcome him here. Such an honor to have you, Dr. Bax. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, first of all, that, that decision I was very much against. And I did not want uh, the US and Europe to separate because I've always looked up to the US. I did my first uh, sort of training in immunology in Florida in the US, and I, I like very much the way things are done here. Um, if I would have had a different background, I would probably have worked here, but we've learned that if you want to go here, because I was asked several times to come here, you need to redo everything. And so from the basic medicine, to, so there was a no-go basically. But I was always very much in favor in keeping us together, HA, ACC, and ESC, but there were others, and then they vote in the board and you count the numbers. And even though I was, leading that I, I could not move that the other thing that i want to say is that it's a very personal thing kim because uh, several years ago and you know what i'm going to say now <laughs> i i was at acc i think it was and um when i go to these meetings it's it's non-stop meetings and lectures and things like five six days really every hour booked and so I hardly ate and I hardly drank anything. And I just work, 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 work. And then the last day I was in the hotel and I got so sick and so much pain. And I was supposed to go to Harvard to do the grand rounds and I uh, was looking very forward to that. And then it got so bad that I, I called him and I said, can you come and take a look at me because I'm supposed to fly tomorrow and I'm not good and he was still there. It was in Orlando, eh? and um, and then he said, "Wow, yeah, big time diverticulitis," and so because of not drinking and eating and anything, and um, so he brought me all this stuff, and eventually it worked. 
And the next day I was so stressed out that I took the plane and flew back straight to Europe to get myself fixed there. <laughs> and um, I didn't visit Harvard after all that, <laughs> that time. But I'm very thankful to you because if you wouldn't have been there, I don't know what I would have done. And it shows that um, we always speak about them patients and, and not and, and us doctors. But once you're in a different position, you don't know what to do, actually. So I was a clear example of that. So I, I thank you very much for that. That's my biggest memory that I have of you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the non-invasive imaging to detect the coronary artery disease. And um, I'll take you through this a little bit. We have worked over the years with all these different modalities. And, and um, um, here we talk about the focus on coronary artery disease. So in 2019, ESC guidelines were made and they tried to change it a little bit. So they talked about diagnosis and management of chronic coronary syndromes. And this is sort of new terminology where they try to bring the different states of coronary disease together. And uh, <clears throat> this is the, um, the um, sort of diagram that they put together. So here's the subclinical phase. Here's a recent diagnosis or an event or revascularization. And it is a long-standing diagnosis. And you see here in green, that's rather silent coronary artery disease. And in red is the ones that get events. And in the middle gets one event and is then stable. So these are the lower risk patients and these are the higher risk patients. I thought that was quite innovative what they did there. They brought the acute coronary syndromes together with the stable coronary disease and the revascularization, et cetera. So we're gonna talk first about this subclinical phase. A subclinical phase, when I talked about this sort of things a couple of years ago, I had nothing to say because in Europe, that was not an issue. We were not as advanced as you are here, looking into screening, looking into earlier uh, prevention, but now it's, it's big time also in Europe. So we talk here about asymptomatic individuals with atypical symptoms at best, but they have an elevated risk for atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease. So the discussion here is screening or early detection. So this is one that we still use a lot. We just do a calcium uh, score. And um, here you see a patient that has no calcifications. This one has very little bit, and this one has a lot. And the more calcium you have, the more atherosclerotic burden you have. It's not completely true because we learned over time when we start to do more and more CT that there's also a lot of non-calcified atherosclerosis. And that's probably the early atherosclerosis. And that is the ones that are probably more vulnerable, we've learned over time. Because in a way, if you develop calcified atherosclerosis, it's in a way now considered plaque healing. So that's stabilizing it. It gives you a burden of how much risk you've had, et cetera. But the real risk we start to realize is more and more the non-calcified atherosclerosis. So this calcium scoring, you can, you can give these scores from one to over a thousand, and it relates to different ways of plaques. Then this is the work from Matt Woodoff. This is 12 years follow-up. And you see here that with the increasing calcium score, your risk goes up. And this is all-cause mortality, 25,000 asymptomatic individuals. But look here, because this this uh, figure is nicely protected, but this is 0.80. So this is 0.90, so over 10 years, your risk is still not that high. In uh, Europe and specifically Netherlands, as I said, we don't do these things, but it starts to come that people are more interested in their health and they want to know things. This is uh, my summary on calcium scoring. So it's the presence of coronary calcifications with increased risk of coronary events. I think it's it's more a marker of coronary disease in general rather than a specific location. It gives you more a total picture. Um, what is important is the one in yellow because that's what people think. And that is certainly not it. It's unable to identify or predict anything event is going to happen. So it's totally different than identify localized vulnerable plaque. So I say it's more of a population risk marker than an individual specific marker. Also, what is important is that the non-calcified lesions you don't see on these scans. And the non-calcified, we learn more and more, as I said, that these are probably the more dangerous ones. They are in a very early state, and these are the ones that are linked with vulnerability. 
So then we move through this thing and we go to this part. So now we're talking about symptomatic patients where the discussion is detection of coronary artery disease. And then comes the question, should I detect atherosclerosis or should I detect ischemia? It has different purposes because if you detect atherosclerosis, you're more in the early treatment phase. Although we learned that some atherosclerosis is very malignant and you should be careful if you have that. Um, when you think about ischemia, we start to think revascularization. So this is uh, the slides that we have from the ESC guidelines. And um, this is the patients with angina and or dyspnea and suspected coronary artery disease. So the first step is assess symptoms. Act like a doctor and do not scan everybody, but first listen to the patient, perform some clinical investigations. If it's unstable, you go to another guideline. Consider the comorbidities and quality of life. In case patient is, and you're not gonna do that much, you should think what you wanna do. So in most, we do resting ECG, biochemistry, chest X-ray, and in selected patients is the chest X-ray, and the echocardiogram is one of the other cornerstones. And based on that, we can assess pretest probability and clinically likelihood of coronary artery disease. That is the fundament of this guideline. So it's a slightly different approach than just doing uh, sensitivity specificity. Then they go for the typicality. And for that, they use this score, typical angina, atypical angina, and non-anginal chest pain. So this is, of course, very difficult. We tried this in the department when you gave a patient to different physicians, uh, five patients, and we rotated that over, I think it was seven physicians the last time we did it. And we asked them to diagnose based on what they got. And you see that what is so clearly defined here is totally not reproducible in the community. Because if we're going to do that, we're going to have five different diagnoses. So typical angina, most following three characteristics, is constricting discomfort, precipitate by physical exertion, relieved by nitrates. That's pretty clear. These are the patients the way you like them to present to you. Atypical is meets at least two of those, meets two of those characteristics, and non-anginal pain is meeting only one. But the more you do it, the more you see that they don't come like that. It's very rare that they tell this story. And even if you push them a little bit, they will not tell you that story. So this typicality is a difficult issue. And then societies try to grade that. And this is from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. So class one, two, three, four, and that is increasing severity of symptoms. So this is only with heavy exercise. This is with moderate exercise. This is with mild exercise and this is at rest. So severity is an important part of that, but also that if we're gonna ask few of us to do it, you will see that it ends up in different um, reports. So how are we gonna diagnose this? And I like this one. This is the clinical likelihood of obstructive coronary artery disease. This is very low and this is very high. So if it's very high, we're not gonna mess around with any imaging. We send the patient straight to the cat lab, invasive angiogram with uh, some form of measurement of severity of the lesion, let's say FFR, or nowadays we have multiple of these approaches. If the likelihood is very, very low, we should not do any test because it's only resulting in confusion and we don't know what to do. If we are in the middle, that's where it gets difficult. So intermediate to lower likelihood, we do a CT scan and we hope that we exclude. And if we include, we get a calcium score plus a CT uh, evaluation. And the worse it is, the more different thinking you're of different tests and ischemia test. If the, um, uh, pre-likelihood is more to the higher part, we do testing for ischemia and mostly imaging if we can in those patients. So we have doing nothing, doing invasive, but most of the patients end up here. And now we start to see more and more of these patients because they are aware that all these tests are available. So everybody gets a bit nervous and gets excluded. <laughs> May I ask you something here? Who of you did a CT scan on him or herself? Nobody? 
I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do it, I tell you. <laughs> I did an exercise test on myself, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is this the right way, or should we give everybody a CT scan, or should we have everybody an ischemia test first? That's difficult. I believe in this thing that if you really have symptoms, etc., your message is you want to rule out problems, you want to rule out obstructive disease that can cause ischemia, because that we know is going to result in bad events. If not, I'm very favorable of this CT. I favor it over calcium score because I see the things and I'm going to take you through the CT business in a little bit. But in 2007, we had a program in Leiden because our, we didn't have a real good uh, chest pain unit as most of you have in here in the US where a patient comes in, has some complaints. You do immediately um, a chest pain unit where he's doing an exercise test or so. I remember that Udelson did that in the beginning and Franz Walkers had one. We didn't have that. So when we didn't have it, um, we hospitalized them real quick if there was higher typicality. And we did a quick CT scan. And if the CT scan was negative, we uh, sent them away. If the CT scan was positive, we followed by an angiogram. Now we have a very good functioning chest pain unit and it's more staged than what I'm just saying. But um, that's where we saw in 2007 that patients could present within the CT scan with totally non-calcified lesions. So if you do calcium score, you're not gonna catch anything. And there was severe uh, atherosclerosis. So we took the patient in a cat lab and it fitted completely. That changed my whole thinking about calcium versus non-calcified, high risk versus low risk. Many of you probably know Jim Min is a guy that I work with a lot in the past. And Jim has now started this company, it's called Clearly. And they do all this analysis of these CT scans. But I discussed a lot with him about non-calcified. What is the importance of it? And I'm convinced that it is a marker of early disease, but also unstable disease. Okay, let's switch back to what we were talking about. So patients with angina and or dyspnea, suspected coronary artery disease. This is the pretest probability of coronary artery disease. It's very simple and therefore also maybe not so reproducible. The age we can reproduce, that is for everybody the same. So we have from 30 to 39 up to 70 plus. Then we have the gender. That's also not a point of discussion. But here is where if you ask people to do it, typical, atypical, non-anginal, I don't know what I should think with that. But dyspnea, Dan Berman published an article where dyspnea was the leading problem that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, the leading problem in a lot of the patients. So dyspnea in itself of shortness of breath is, is really not non-cardiac. That can be quite much. So then we have here these different colors. So the pretest like this is based on age, gender, and typicality of the pain. And as I said to you, we added this one in that latest guideline. And the dark green is where imaging is most beneficial. Your pretest like dude is over 15%. And in the light green, imaging may be considered. You can do it if you want to. Pretest like dude between 5 and 15. And in the grayish, you should not do any imaging because the likelihood is very, very low. Then you want to do a little bit more. So patients with angina and or dyspnea suspected coronary artery disease, you want to pretest likelihood what you have based on sex and age and the nature of the symptoms. But you want to increase that. And I've put here the decreased ones and the increasing likelihood ones. So if you look at the increasing likelihood ones, is you have multiple risk factors. You have resting ECG changes. Most of these patients will get immediately an echocardiogram in the, in the assessment, so LV dysfunction. Uh, abnormal exercise or coronary calcium by CT. All of that before you start going to the algorithm is usually done in the ones with a higher likelihood. This decreases the likelihood, normal exercise, no calcium, but I put that marker there that we've seen really significant amount of patients that have absolutely no calcium, but have a lot of atherosclerosis and probably more vulnerable atherosclerosis. That is what I put here. Just remember that. And then this is meant to further enrich the pretest probability of coronary disease. I like this. This is from Patterson 89. And it's very simple. I see you smile because this is pretty simple, actually. This says the pretest clinical probability, and this says the post test probability. And what you want to do is if this one and that one are really separated, then the testing is useful because this 
positions the test, the patient at a low risk. I switch it from here to very low. And this put the patient after a test at high risk. So in those patients in the middle here, testing is the most useful. Here, if I have a negative test or a positive test, it doesn't make any difference because the likelihood is very, very low. And in the ones over here, if I have negative test or positive, it still remains very high. So it's around this area of pretest likelihood where I think you should test. If we are in the intermediate to low, it's the general assumption that we should test for atherosclerosis, so CT scan. 51 years old, outpatient clinic, some discomfort that they say, and you don't know what to do. What is the pretest likelihood? Here you see it, 11%. He's in the light green, so we're going to do something. I always like to translate it in what is the question. So the question for us is, does the patient have atherosclerosis? Should I give medical therapy or should I just discharge him if there is nothing? So we order non-invasive anatomical tests to detect or exclude atherosclerosis. And the one that's mostly available is a CT scan. Here you see one of those scans and it's so easy to pick up um, the calcium in the vessels. Here's the liver, and then here is all calcium in the vessels. We process that now. This is called curved MPRs, and uh, I have the right coronary, the LAD, and the LCX. And here you see already that there is non-calcified issues. This one's totally normal. Here is some calcium. And then just a side step. This is what we see not infrequent. So the ones of us who work with invasive assessment of these patients say that is bridging. But this is not bridging because bridging is during the cycle that it gets compressed. Heart contracts and the coronary gets compressed and it gives you some sort of ischemia. This is not bridging. This is intramural course because the CT scan doesn't is not a functional test. It's an anatomical test. But you see this quite often if you do um, a lot of CTs. So this is one meta-analysis was already published in 2008. And this I think is the take home message that if there is no non-calcified and no calcified lesions, you're done, patient needs to go. And that's how we do in the Netherlands. I think in your country also a lot that you do a CT scan, everything normal. And that is then end of the discussion. Then we have seen that the more calcium you have, this is normal, this is non-obstructive, this is uh, non-high risk and is the high risk, the mortality goes up in parallel to the severity of the lesions. What about this here? This is an older CT scan, but you see here is something, there is something, there's a step artifact, here is for sure something. How do we manage that? So I work with Hans Reiber. Hans Reiber is an engineer and he has all these software programs. And then when he has something new, before he commercializes it, he comes to me and then we need to see how it works. And we put it in the clinics and we see how it works. So this is all the parameters that you can get from that. In a nutshell, it gives you the plaque extent, it gives you the plaque location, and it gives you the plaque severity. And from that, we worked with this risk score that Alexander van Rosendaal did when uh, he was with me after he went to uh, New York and now he's back with us. So plaque location, the number of segments, plaque severity and plaque composition, you put it in one score. And the higher that score is, the higher the risk is. And that defines in a way how you're gonna treat the patient. What I got more interested in over the recent years is this plaque constitution. This was done in 2011. This is what I told you where we did the CT scans. Here you have a big non-calcified lesion. You got some calcium there. And we did in this patient directly in this angiogram and uh, also this um, virtual histology. And you see that the red is assumed to be at higher risk area. And that's the one here. And with the newer softwares, we can depict that like that. So are these lesions vulnerable plaques? Is that what we're looking for? This is the work uh, that we published together with Jim Min. And this is from a database where patients had um, different CT scans and follow-ups <clears throat> and the patients with the acute coronary syndromes were taken out. And if you look at patients with acute coronary syndromes versus the one that didn't get after the CT scan, you see here the first that the blue one is higher than that one and the orange and the gray are higher. So what is that? That's the total plaque volume and the orange and the um, gray are markers 
of what we think vulnerability, increasing necrotic core, increasing fibrophatic plaque image. So when should I then revascularize? Can I do that based on this information? Then we came to the functional test. There was John Leipzig who did a lot of that work. So hemodynamic significance of the stenosis, he introduced this FFR CT concept, calculation of FFR from CT, anatomical 3D modeling, computational fluid dynamics, simulating coronary physiology, and that gives you vessel specific FFR. Well, here's an example of that. This is the data set that's being processed into that. Then there's the physiology testing, then there's all the computer work, and then you get this here. Here I see lesion that has an FFR 0.86, so clinically not so relevant. This one is 0.75, so clinically relevant. This one's 95, is not relevant. So that was compared with invasive assessments. It's certainly not ideal, but it's also not that bad. Give you some more examples. Um, this is a lesion on the CT. This is the same one on the invasive angiogram. The FFR is 0.94. Here, the FFR is 0.93. So it matches pretty well. Here's another one, heavy lesion, FFR 0.65. CT, not exactly the same, but 0.56. The FFR on a CT is considered abnormal when it's below, let's say, 80. Um, and here you see other lesions, and the matching is not that bad, 0 0.71, 0 0.75. So then came the advanced study from John Leipzig, that's a registry. And what they wanted to do is whether the integration of FFRCT on top of CTA will lead to a change in the management of coronary disease in patients of stable angina. So they took 5,000 patients in Europe, US, and other countries. And they used these data to plan, should they have medical therapy, should they have PCI, should they have bypass surgery? And the primary endpoint was the reclassification rate. So this is how it goes. Patient comes in, stable angina, meets the inclusion, get the coronary CT, and from the coronary CT, the FFR CT is done. Here you see an example. This is a severe lesion probably with the 0.50. This one doesn't have any severe lesions. So this one is considered for revascularization. That one goes medical. And then based on these treatments, they saw that if your FFR CT was 0.8 and higher, the outcomes was very good. But if it was lower than that, the outcomes were much more um, not good. And here you see that in green is the patient ending with bypass surgery, in red, PCI, and 14% had an invasive coronary angiogram. But if the FRCT was negative, nothing much came out. So it's certainly not that if your FFR is positive that you're always ending in revascularization. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the patient knocking that something needs to happen or so. Okay, so his conclusion were that no atherosclerosis or non-obstructive, you do medical therapy, significant stenosis, you do a CTFFR. And with that CTFFR, you determine if it's significant, you do invasive angiogram, and if it's not, you do medical therapy. And that was done by Pam Douglas in this study that she did, the platform study. Here's all these patients with suspected coronary disease. They follow the usual care track and they go for invasive coronary angiography. And based on that obstructive revascularization, non-obstructive, um, nothing. And when you implement in between there, the CT plus an FFR, this is the same amount of patients, they go in and many of them that have nothing, you can rule out before anything. So I think that's the message from her. If the CT is minimal and if the FFR CT is negative, you can rule out obstructive lesions and non-obstructive CAD. This is what we have been doing um, also over the years, working with lesions on CT and then do a CT perfusion study. And you see that here is absolutely an area of perfusion reduced during stress, pharmacological stress. And if you then make the same images at rest, you don't see anything but the point is this is very time consuming it goes more with more radiation so it's something that so far did not get to uh, to the clinical arena so now we have talked about ct so lower intermediate likelihood those patients ct is a good first test then if you go to the patients with more uh, higher likelihoods then the question is does the patient have ischemia should i revascularize should i not revascularize so i have a man 61 years old outpatient clinic chest pain at rest sometimes stress 
what is the pretense likelihood? So is here significant. And if we then look at such patients, high likelihood to have atherosclerosis, that's probably happening. And the question is, does he have ischemia? Do I need to intervene? So we order non-invasive ischemia tests. We have all these sort of tests. This is the time from onset of ischemia. And over this ischemic cascade, you see hypoperfusion, diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, easy G change, then comes angina. This we can measure with perfusion scans. And this we can measure with systolic motion imaging, such as MRI or echo or even CT. All these tests are pretty good. The sensitivities are good and the specificities are good. But the point here is if you do an exercise ECG, that lacks significant in sensitivity. And that's why we like to do an imaging. What imaging should you do? The one that you feel comfortable with, the one where you have a lot of experience. The rest doesn't matter that much. Why do we have this in this ESC guideline? Because a lot of countries in Europe, especially when you go to Eastern Europe, I visited there many times, they have nothing else than just an exercise test. So if we would leave that out, they got nothing. That's why we left it in. Okay, so here's a nuclear study. This is stress, this is rest. This is the area or the burden of ischemia. You can do a SPECT study, you can do a PET study. Doesn't make much difference except the resolution. You can do a stress echo. And you can also do with contrast. So here you see that if I do it without contrast, I cannot really see what's happening. So that's why we do all the stress echoes nowadays with intravenous contrast. That works very well. And you can pick up the whole motion quite easily. And eventually you can also do a stress MRI. We do that sometimes, but we don't have a lot of space. So we don't do this on a routine basis. But of course the stress MRI, you see what's happening there? This is mitral regurg coming. So it gives you much more information than pure echo. That's why I like it. So especially if you have intermittent ischemia related uh, mitral dysfunction, you can easily pick that up. Okay, then we can also do, we worked a bit with that stress perfusion imaging with MRI. Here you see this, when I saw that picture, I thought, yeah, this must be an artifact because it's all over subendocardial. But this was the angiogram of the patient and you see that indeed he had severe three vessel disease. We've been doing a series from that, I think um, 100 consecutives and it is indeed very good if you compare, but it's a bit cumbersome, it takes more time. So we discussed the different modalities and then if you bring that in your clinical pathway, then here is the patient, low likelihood enter with coronary CT, higher likelihood enter with an ischemia test then goes to drug therapy. And if the symptoms continue, we do an invasive angiogram. Then we do a functional assessment and we revascularize. And patients with a stenosis more than 90% or have already had the ischemia test, those ones go straight for revascularization. That is what the guidelines have. So we go back to our patients. How do we manage this patient now? He got revascularized. And then I want to take your time just the last couple of minutes, when should I revascularize stenosis more than 90%? Should it be ischemia based? And so this one, and I've on purpose taken the earliest slides that I got from Judy Hockman. This is this ischemia study. And I think it brought us more questions than really answers because if you follow that, they get a CT scan at the beginning and then you randomize to that. And if we looked then at these curves, all of the curves show the same thing that there was no difference between invasive and non-invasive management. Here, the primary outcome, cardiovascular death, infarction, hospitalization, et cetera. Major secondary, net clinical benefit, all of them show the same. So the conclusion of this was that all were the same. But one thing that I asked myself, if we're gonna follow up these patients longer, this probably is gonna make a difference. So, then the discussion was, should we do no more tests? Does everybody go medical? Now I'm gonna give you two stories. And I presented this at Valentin Fuster's meeting. And um, that was when this stuff was just out. And I traveled from Washington to New York to get to do this lecture. And I was sitting in the train that morning before I had my lecture and I was working on my computer to get the presentation ready. and I. I didn't have a good entrance for this. And then there was a guy sitting next to me, some sort of business guy in a suit, and he was working his computer. And uh, he looked at me and said, what are you doing? 
So I said, well, I have to give this lecture and it's about uh, medical. He says, you guys, medical, you are super. My brother, he had a hip problem. They replaced it and he's like this. You guys in medical are super. That was a symptom. He had a symptom and he couldn't function well. And so he got a hip. But we in cardiology make it more complex. Patients have symptoms. We want then a test that's confirming what we have. So only based on physiology. Yes, there is good in it, but there's also a lot of patients who just present with uh, symptoms. And so the question is, I'm not saying that we should do everything based on symptoms, but I have this patient myself. This is a guy, an academic guy. He worked with the oil company Shell. He had multiple revascularizations. I see him since many, many years. And at some moment he comes back and he says to me, I have these complaints again. It's cold, I go outside, I walk a bit and I get pain, very typical. And so I don't do any other test. I send him to the cat lab. And now this FFR is getting very hip. People like to do that. So in several weeks later, two weeks later, he's again on the outpatient clinic and I said, what, what do you come to do here? And he says, well, they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything, what do you mean? So I go to the report, cannot find it. So I walk down to the cat lab and said, what have you done to this guy? Because the one in the cat lab who leads the things, a very good friend. So I said to him, what, what's, what's wrong with this? And he says, yeah, we did the FFR and he just didn't make it. I said, but he's back to me and he has lots of symptoms and he has a story like this. Do we only do the procedures when we have an evidence? I said, take him back and just revascularize him. So they did revascularize him and the symptoms were gone. So from that, I learned things, you know, that how do you deal with patients? If you know them well, you can do these things. But then comes also the question that was put forward based on this ischemia trial, that our goal is always longevity improvement. But the quality of life, and I block on his name who, who published on that, but he was one of the ischemia uh, investigators. He published several articles about improving quality of life. Now that makes it very difficult for us. But if you work in oncology, for example, it's all about quality of life. And a lot of things are being done where you gain maybe five days or so. So in cardiology, we are so advanced. We have all these randomized controlled trials and sometimes it's gonna put you in difficult situations. That's just what I wanted to say, but I think that's an important message. That's maybe the only message I wanna give you this morning that we, we need these guidelines. I've been chair of the guidelines committee of ESC and it is important, but at the same time, um, it doesn't bring us everything. Let me see. So the conclusions on that CTA part is, um, CTA is good as first testing, no atherosclerosis, non-obstructive medical therapy, significant stenosis, revascularization, higher pretest likelihood, first ischemia test, revascularization, no ischemia, medical therapy. This is what I wanted to give to you is my thoughts on things. I also put in some very you know, personal things where you could say, well, I don't see it differently uh, for sure. But I got this, this thinking about symptoms when I sat next to the guy in the train who told me that. Thanks very much. Eight forty four is pretty good, right? <laughs> you could be the moderator, I'll yeah. be the runner. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Bax. So one quick question uh, that really has changed the way we do things when I was at Rush recently and now uh, on service here at uh, University Hospital. It's a high sensitivity uh, troponin. Mm -hmm. It really makes a difference in terms of your thinking because you're presuming that you've got something that has a negative predictive value that's superior to anything you've had in the past in terms of if anything keeps going on with the chest pain patient. Yeah. Uh, the hard part is that it's positive for every, every and all reasons. And so, um, <laughs> for example, almost every, it seemed like every patient was a trauma person. And if you fell out of a tree or you had a car accident, your troponin was high. And so uh, how does, has, has that penetrated 
uh, Europe has been out for quite a while. It's taken a long, a long time to get uh, settled in the United States. Uh, does that change the way you approach patients? Uh, well, it was mostly or partially based on this troponin business because the rule out sometimes and the, the CT paper I referred to, they didn't have elevated troponins, but they had a story that was very unpleasant and there was other things that made us think. And then we put them in the cat lab based on the CT and it almost always confirmed what we saw. If that lesion was a lesion that was silent there, I don't know, but the patient comes with symptoms. ECG is normal. The troponins are a little bit borderline. They're getting there, but they're not there. So we normally would send them away. And we tried that with this chest pain unit. We did the CT and we revascularized based on some of that, what we found. So I think that the troponins doesn't tell at all. If you look at these patients, they come back. And then comes also the question, uh, these are indeed unstable patients. Are you feeling comfortable? right, in the emergency room with the troponins. But you have a lot of stable patients, the ones that I pointed out where you also don't know really what's going on. And the CT is very helpful, I think, in my opinion, in determining direction where you're gonna go. How do you feel about this? Well, so what I feel like I'm missing, if I don't have the CT, is I don't have the, what you were characterizing as the pre-symptomatic atherosclerosis, where we can intervene now, get the area under the lifetime LDL curve down yeah. um, by intervening now, now we yeah. learned to stay away from kind of play with therapy aspirin on low on the low scores uh, because of the little bit of risk. It's not worth it, um, but I think we really make an impact with CT. So I think so too, and it it of course is all of that going to translate eventually in better outcomes. There's some data that hint in the direction, and so but you need to have huge populations to get answers to the question. But before we're going to get these answers it has already gotten into the clinical practice. Because what I showed you, we started doing that in 2007 and now everything is routine. This is the way we handle the patients. Maybe one day we will say that was not the right approach, but I think in a way it is probably, uh, it helped us a lot to better stratify the patients. I'm a non-cardiologist, I'll grab this question from that. Um, I think so you're a smart individual then. <laughs> so I think it's all great, honestly. It's going to, you know, stack an expensive test on expensive tests. It's going to save my life in the future from my life here in America. All of that is a thing. Uh, the problem is I, I lived and worked in East Africa for many years ago. I had no cardiovascular problems. And we're leaving the rest of the world behind. Um, and we know this. We know that the large proportion of cardiovascular disease in the world is not in the countries where we do this testing. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a paper a few days ago in European Heart Journal saying that mm -hmm. ESC guidelines are largely unrelatable to the majority of them. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, are we just worsening the disparity of cardiovascular care in the world by focusing on these new innovations and not focusing on how to transition and things that we already have into the rest of the world? Or are we actually worsening the outcome in the world by like doing this? I think that's hard to answer that question, <laughs> but I see what you say because I go every summer since quite some years to South Africa and then I lecture at the Barwanat Hospital. Do you know that one? Barwanat Hospital, that is the oldest hospital um, that is in uh, Johannesburg and it was basically built for everybody. And there were people, um, Alec Vanyan trained there and quite some Barlow, the valve comes from there, the Barlow valve. And so a lot of these luminary people were there. And so they, they treat every patient. And when you see that, you realize that this stuff that we do is by far not what they have. In a way you come into some of the wards and they don't even have a bed, they lay on the floor and so I've seen that all. And that makes you think, yeah, what we do, how much can that be transferred to other countries? Well, not, really not. And um, so I see your point, but in a way this is developing so quickly with us. Yeah, that you can not join, but it will continue anyway. Then I prefer to be involved also through guidelines. Um, I told you that I, I did that committee for a while 
And I was very much in favor, as I said, doing this together with the US so that at least we form one consortium. The underlying point is, I think I mentioned it already, is the citations of these things. Because these citations of guidelines are huge. And ESC wanted for that reason to have their own guidelines. I was never in favor of that because I think we work as one community and we should do that. But that's how it went. So yeah, to come back to your point, I think that is that is very difficult. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. I can also not, but it is an unstoppable phenomenon because in Netherlands a couple of years ago, I would say in front of this room, we don't have places where I can just walk in and put some money down and I get a CT scan. But now we have. And sometimes it brings a lot of stress because patients see things that they don't want to see or makes a lot of extra testing needed and eventually nothing comes out. That doesn't answer your question, but I'm just ventilating a couple of thoughts on, on testing and too much testing and too little testing. And I, I think that's very, very difficult issue. But I'm completely with you. Um, if you go to Africa and you see this situation in the hospital, yeah, then all these fancy things, it's never achievable for them. At the same time, there are also very wealthy hospitals in these areas where the richer people go and where everything is possible. So I think your point is, is, is really excellent and it highlights the big disparities that we're facing. If you go to India, where I've been many times also, um, you see in some places that people have everything and even better than what we have. But in other places, they have really nothing. You see people dying on the street. I've seen it. And you ask yourself this question, what are we doing and what are they doing? Now, I cannot answer you, but I share with you. Yes, thank you very much for the information. I have a question about the asymptomatic patients that have hyperporic calcium. We don't have any level one guidelines here in the United States what to do with these people. Um, I read an article in Jack Imaging four or five years ago, Dr. Irwin, and an echo expert, and they suggested that scores over 100 have some type of functional test. And, you know, they were the respected author, and I started doing something about like how the yield was so low that it was. Uh, and then uh, other people have suggested that I told you 400 might be a reason to do some type of functional test. My, my billing people told me this because when they were trying to schedule people that were asymptomatic and we couldn't get chest pain or dyspnea down, that the insurance companies would pay for scores over 400, but they wouldn't pay low. Uh, I've got another well respected guy yeah, from St. Louis University, Anthony Pearson, who doesn't feel uh, anybody that's truly asymptomatic doesn't need a functional test. What is your opinion on this and what do you do clinical? For people with scores of 400, 1,000, 3,000, uh, that you just can't see the bad symptom, uh, what, what do you do in that situation? Well, first of all, the first thing that goes through my mind is in Netherlands, just the calcium score is not done. So I never get confronted with that problem, but we have had many discussions before about it. And to put a number and then do something else, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense because, as you said, the yield is basically nothing and cutoffs also don't tell us much because I showed that to you, this calcium score alone, yeah, it discriminates, but everything will discriminate because whatever you do and it's big enough, there will some be some higher mortality. But if you can translate this finding into a big population and project that on an individual basis, that's where the things often go wrong. And I think that, that is, uh, that's the key issue here. So we never do that. Um, we do what I showed you, CT scan, if it is a lower to intermediate, intermediate to lower likelihood. And then my hope is to rule it out. If I rule it in and it's all non-obstructive and mostly calcified, I do um, medical therapy as we discussed and I don't do anything else. I'm not gonna do, um, stress testing or so on top of that, only if there are symptoms. So this is basically how I handle it. What's the data? 
a lot of these things, there isn't much data. And because the, the economic drive, so to say, of building companies and making money out of medicine, that's to some part supporting these things that you were just talking about. And as I said to you in Netherlands, yeah, we, we cannot really commercialize for the moment these things. So there's also not so much interest in, and that is also why uh, the healthcare costs are increasing, but are not increasing as fast as, for example, here, um, that these, these things are not available. I cannot walk somewhere and say, get me an echo or so. What's the data on either with multiple stents that's killing you, even with biotest perhaps, that is it as strong as in Florida? You mean if you your diagnosis in patients with when they have stents? Yeah, patients have multiple stents. And then I do a CT scan. Yeah. Well, it has improved a little bit, but I still think that the artifacts that you see with uh, most of the stents doesn't make possible that you do a good diagnosis. So we don't do it. Um, in GI, we uh, see a lot of leakers, and so we come in from the globe five and have chest pain, and we're saying we're going to demand something. That is kind of a question about with CTA, you, you mentioned it's valuable for non obstructive as well. And what is the time frame? So I'm having chest pain that has to be so, you know, do you have to get it within a certain period of time if there's uh, so your question is, if the patient has symptoms, should I do a CT scan then within so-and-so time frame? Yeah. Well, that depends a little bit on the pretest likelihood. That's a very simple algorithm what we have based on the gender and the age. And so these, these things we have in the, um, in the words so that people immediately can see that. And if the likelihood is higher, sometimes we go directly for a functional test rather than for an atherosclerosis test. If it's lower, we do an atherosclerosis test and we treat according to what we find. It's all difficult issues eh? because people try to put it in guidelines, but it's very hard to put this in guidelines. Every patient is different. We try to look for cutoffs and every technique is different and every technique has a different way, different information that it provides. And for me, it's still not clear if an ischemia test is resulting in a lot of events or there's not that many events, but people recently believe more, but it's better to revascularize to prevent events. I think the more we do, sometimes the more confusing it gets. Then you need to bring it back to something simple. So that's why we put this sort of algorithms, lower likelihood, lower intermediate CT scan, include or exclude, exclude is not to come back. Then of course, there are people that start to um, talk about um, sort of other syndromes that you can have with the coronary arteries that can create the pain. But then you get totally lost because you have no substrate that you can measure or you do difficult PET scans where you find certain things in perfusion or so. These are difficult. So I like to keep it simple because the number of patients is only increasing and the waiting lists are sometimes quite long. So we try to keep the simple algorithms to, and I think with the simple algorithms, you, you don't catch and you don't rule out 100%, but at least you have a way of going through. So you pointed out that um, the calcium score doesn't localize. Now, yeah. given that you uh, do mostly CT and mm -hmm. um, if you were to see, uh, for example, a lot of calcified plaque in proximal LAD, is that where you also see a lot of non-calcified plaque? So, you know, that's something that I guess a more of a problem that we have here because we use a, quite a bit of CT coronary calcium score. And you know, frequently you see a patient with a lot of proximal LAD. That's where, and you, you ask yourself, is there where you know, if this was all calcified, I'd be less worried that if there's also a bunch of non-calcified plaque there, as you pointed out. So, is that what you see that they both actually co localize? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, not so often. I think you have more, and these are we don't have 
really rock solid data, but it hints in the direction that these are patients with longer lasting and better treated. So you see that with the treatments, we move them into the calcification. Um, and the patients that are more acute, we see this non-calcified much more. But if you look at the total coronary tree, then often there is uh, a little bit of everything. So that makes it more complex. I think we are not at the stage that we can blindly direct our interventions purely based on a CT. I think we need some sort of functional testing with it. I still believe in the story of ischemia that that is going to, despite the trial, although you see the curves already this going a little bit away from each other, I think that ischemia is still the one that um, for us drives the decision to go revascularization. What do you think yourself about that? Is that how you do it also? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, again, I use, uh, I don't read CTs, but I use quite a bit of CAS Explorer. And mm -hmm. um, I always wonder because, you know, frequently get these uh, CTs and there's a bunch of calcium in LAD, one small mm -hmm. LAD, and you're like, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. You know, yes. You know, I, I, I and what are you need? What, what are you? That's, that's fairly easy. Mm -hmm. that, you know, you, yeah. you know, the more calcium, Global risk is high, yeah. but you know uh, we all get more scared about possible mid LAT. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do with? It? Yeah, that's that. So I, I go with function with mm -hmm. symptoms, and yeah. if there are no symptoms, I treat them aggressively. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I like to lower. You know, we have our guidelines. Um, you know, primary prevention LDL less than 100. But I, you know, I would say, uh, you know, I would tell patients if you were the president of the United States, less than 100 is not good enough. I want you lower than that, even if you've never had an event. So, you know, I sort of, you know, we talk about diet. We all, it's sort of holistic, everything, try to do everything that we can in order to get the risk down. But if there are no symptoms, I wouldn't go any further. Yeah, we feel, we feel the same, that we still treat by symptoms, but it's not, it's sometimes that you get surprised in a way that you say, wow, we saw this before, nothing, symptoms. And all of a sudden, that is not certain that, but all of a sudden, something happens, right? Comes to the emergency room and it's all wrong. And so that makes it so, so difficult. And I think the technology is outpacing our understanding. And the technology, of course, is being pushed in because it's business economy. But in a way, that is what's happening. And that is unstoppable. It will happen with a lot of other things. And so that makes it complex to, to position exactly. We like to say, okay, that goes there and that goes there. It's unfortunately not that simple. So then you deal with, we often discuss these sort of things within the group and say, okay, what do we feel? Should we go this way, that way? And we go through the evidence there is, and then we decide and then we go that way. Yeah, yeah. And one more question. So, you know, um, I was thinking about your remark on the United States president. That's a big <laughs> issue also in Europe. <laughs> we look at that every day. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we use troponin, troponin here uh, as an inpatient test. Mm -hmm. has become what we call part of the rainbow. So it is ordered unrelated to symptoms. It's part of, you know, when the patient arrives, you get a you know, sodium potassium reactant you also get a troponin, regardless of what's going on. And so, you know, we frequently get these questions. Okay, so patient has doctor Williams pointed out. Now, uh, you know, that also helps us diagnose a lot of type 2 MRIs. Mm -hmm. Do you use CT to look at type 2 MRIs? There, there's at least one picture that shows that 60% of the patients with type 2 MI, the reason they have type 2 MI is they have underlying obstructive disease. And of course, then there's something else that they need anemia or hypotension, something else on top of, of the obstructive coronary disease in the background, and they yeah. need troponin or they have troponin elevation. Do you use CT in inpatient setting or these? Uh, first of all, do you guys use troponin? Yeah, we do. We do the same as what you were, yeah. And then what do you do? Do you use CT when you find these troponins in patients with no symptoms whatsoever? No, what we, yeah, what we usually do is that it comes usually from departments where you're doing a consult right, in the gastroenterology, as you said, or other, and then you find this and you have a dilemma. And then what we do is first that treatment is being uh, ended, 
and then comes to us on the outpatient clinic, and then we make sort of a plan what we're going to do with them. So mostly outpatient. Outpatient, yeah, yeah, not inpatient, no, because that would prolong the stay immensely. And uh, you're in an unstable other situation. It's just a way of thinking, but that's how we do it, yeah. Is that the same with you do? So we do, uh, we do also a lot of inpatient uh, mm -hmm. with these patients, uh, dependent on, uh, you know, you, there's really no uniformity in practice. I can see, I just look around my mm -hmm. old colleagues and, you know, everybody sort of developed their own system. And so part of that is because really don't know what to do. Like, there's there's yeah. no there's no bad aspect to So yeah. you know there's a what's your gestalt? What's your feeling of you know yeah. if, if patient comes with stroke and troponin is three thousand, you know you have another vascular system. So this must be something that's yeah. get this earlier at. But if it's a thirty nine year old in a trauma, yeah maybe not. But... Yeah, this is very difficult. And it 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 the more we know, the more we get in sort of situations where you don't know what to do. And um, we have a rather quick throughput system. So if they have been there, then in two weeks or so, we see them. Um, so that goes rather quick. Um, it was for a while that everything was blocked and nothing was moving. So we brought a different system now and that works pretty well. Um, and that's how we do it. <laughs> Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we'll we'll close here, and uh, Dr. Back will be available for questions for those or those who want to talk to him after this. So thank you all for coming, and it was such a delight to have you here, Dr. Back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.